Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, just a, a huge thank you to, to everyone who have um, taken time out of what I'm imagining is a really busy Tuesday uh, to join us today. This is the second in a series of webinars about engaging design for uh, the remote context that we're experiencing right now. My name is Mike Piper. I'm a faculty member of CASDA. And uh, in a, a few moments, I'm going to uh, also introduce our awesome panelists uh, who are joining us today. But first, I just want to take care of a couple of housekeeping items. Um, I'm sharing my screen, so you should be able to see the first slide of our slide deck for leveraging engagement for meaningful remote instruction. And I just want to share with you a Google site that I've created for uh, our presentation today so that you know you will not need to take any notes. There's nothing that you're going to need to commit to memory. Um, with Zoom, if you are using uh, a larger screen device like a laptop and you roll over sort of the bottom section of your screen, you should see all of the features that Zoom offers you. One of them is chat. So I just want to let you know that that chat space is an excellent place for you to pose questions, um, share insights, uh, cut and paste resources, links to things that you think are helpful. Please uh, go crazy there <laughs> and uh, enjoy that space. But I want to let you know that's there. And then I'm just going to take you quickly to our Google site. And I'm discovering that I'm going to need to move some things around here real quick. There are a couple of things that I just want to show you up in this right hand corner that are good for you to know. The slide deck that you're going to see today, that's all right here on the Google site. And when you visit the site, you'll be able to click down towards the bottom of this screen and control that, um, that slide deck. And, and the links will be active. Everything will be active there. And then there's another page here that I'm really pleased to, to provide. Um, this is about two weeks worth of work here. Um, of just you know, kind of compiling uh, resources that have been super helpful uh, to my thinking over the last couple of weeks. I've not annotated it, but I've tried to create headings that are explanatory enough that they capture what those resources are going to be dealing with. Um, and it, it covers just about everything. Um, Carly Mead is our one of our two instructional technologists with CASDA, and she's creating these short, like two-minute videos that are super helpful. Um, there's a ton of stuff on assessment, um, a ton of tools, general tips for going remote, um, some things to keep in mind regarding issues of equity, um, SEL resources and helpful things to keep in mind, just a few links, uh, folks to follow. Um, if we're doing any kind of online discussion groups and discussion work, some helpful structures and tips, our students with special needs, and specifically science and math, some, some helpful places there, and then an, a, just an awesome article specifically for parents, but it's for everybody who cares about the educational enterprise. So I'm just going to, uh, move forward and, and, and just repeat for those of us who are tuning in a little bit late. Um, administratively, we've muted your microphones and blinded your video feed. So, you know, you're going to be able to see us, hear us, but don't worry about your mics being live. And I talked to you um, about the chat and that's going to be sort of our open forum. Today's objectives. We're going to review those four principles from our text engagement by design. We're going to talk about the principles of universal design for learning. And as we go through those things, our panelists are going to be sharing how these features are informing the instruction that they're doing with their students. Then we're just going to talk briefly about some examples of those resources. 
And then I've got some questions that I'm going to be sharing uh, as we wrap things up today. And that's really about how our, cons our, our conversation is going to move forward. I think at this point, though, it's super helpful uh, to begin with a song. Um, because whenever we begin any daunting enterprise, I think uh, if this video works, and if it doesn't, many of you have already seen this. one of the best ways that I can process the whole transition to online learning and teaching is to write a song. So I wrote a song. So I'd like to share that with you guys now. Here we go. <laughs> Additional objective is that uh, I hope you don't feel like screaming at the end of this webinar. In fact, I hope we de-stress you a little bit at the very least. And now our esteemed panelists, I want to say a special thank you to our four professionals who are joining us today. Rob Schmidt, if you could just give a wave, Rob. Sure, hi. Yeah, uh, you and I are the males here. Uh, fifth grade teacher from Pine Bush Elementary in Gilderland, um, Sophie Whalen. Elementary. Oh. <laughs> uh, eighth grade special ed certified co-teacher at Farnsworth Middle School in Gilderland. Mary Grace Judge. Hi everyone. Eighth grade math co-teacher with Sophie at Farnsworth Middle School and Alicia Wine. Hello. And uh, Alicia is joining us from Gilderland High School. I'm starting to sense that there might be a little bit of a delay. Can I get a nod from my panelists in my voice? Okay, all right. Um, I'll try to kind of factor that in as I talk. Um, you can see that I have really uh, relied heavily on my contacts from Gilderland in bringing panelists into this conversation. My experience over the last several weeks is that professional educators of uh, every form and in every position are absolutely crazily overwhelmed right now. And um, it, no matter how kind I am in my appeal for them to volunteer, they, um, they try so hard to explain to me, but they no longer have to. Uh, the folks from Gilderland, however, if I abuse their time by giving them way too much additional work, um, they know where I live and they know how to get back at me. So they've consented because they do enjoy that power over me. I also wanna say thank you to the panelists for engaging you know, just in the basic personal hygiene um, necessary to be viewable to all of us today. It's super appreciated. I appreciate that you clothe the top half of your bodies as we are uh, want to do these days. And, um, and I'm just, honestly so incredibly grateful uh, for the time that you've given prior and the time you're giving today so thank you so our text um, is engagement by design uh, we took a look at this uh, back on April 2nd and it, basically these wonderful authors our primary authors are Doug Fisher and Nancy Fry and Russ Qualia they distilled in their book what all of us as professional educators know are some of the key components to what make wonderful teaching. The inviting classroom, or in this case, virtual learning space, the importance of relationships, clarity in instruction, and challenge. These four components in, in their view combined together to make instructional design that is powerfully engaging. And we're just going to kind of key in on each one of these components as we go along. At the base of this slide, you're going to see a link to Corwin's free resource page for this text. There are a whole bunch of printouts. Um, it's structured chronologically, chapters one through five. And um, there are videos as well that you can take a look at that illustrate all throughout the text what they're talking about. When we start with the first component, an invitational classroom and being intentionally invitational, 
The first principle of invitational education is, of course, trust. And I'm just going to kind of take a look at this bottom section here to build, maintain, and repair the relationships that we build with kids. That last part is super important because we are wonderfully imperfect beings and we are going to take risks. We're gonna fall short at times, we're gonna miss the mark and we're gonna make mistakes. And doing the necessary repair for those relationships is super important and I love that they included that. Obviously respect and respecting everyone's autonomy and identity and their value to our learning community. I love this idea of everybody having a shared responsibility to themselves and members of the classroom, including the teacher, and that we are stewards of maintaining the social and emotional well-being of the others in our group. Optimism, I love that they've included this, that each member of our learning community has untapped potential, and it is the responsibility of all members of that community to tap it, to find ways so that each of us reaches our potential. And then intentionality. And this kind of pulls all customers. And that what, what actually happens in reality and what we intend can be two different things. So constantly revisiting our practice and making sure it aligns with a, being an invitational school. Now, the invitational teacher, um, you know, I, I think that any of us who have ever worked in a classroom knows that we would love to be in the upper right-hand quadrant all the time, but that's a difficult space to, to stay in. Um, if you see some of these descriptions, there are times where you know as a teacher you may be intentionally uninviting. Um, not where you want to be. Um, it happens. Um, all of us have been in classrooms where we may have seen a teacher in that space. The really uninviting teacher. And then we move counterclockwise into better spaces. There are a couple of bullets in that unintentionally inviting section. We're unaware of what works in our practice and why. We have fewer means for responding when student learning is resistant to our usual methods. With reflection, with collegial support and professional development, we move from that area and we start to occupy that space we all want to stay as much in as possible the intentionally inviting space and everything is working well in that regard uh, because i'm an english language arts teacher um, this poem by hafiz is uh, one that i've loved and i, I just i kind of put it there because i love this poem and i think it speaks to what we ultimately want for our kids i just want to stop for a little bit and 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 just you know anybody at this point on our panel alicia rob mary grace sophie when you think about some of the steps that you've taken recently to creating an invitational space online for your kids what comes to mind anybody can start uh sure i'll, I'll begin if if you want um Hi, this is Rob Schmidt, and um, I guess one of the most important things when you're creating an invitational uh, classroom or an inviting classroom is to really make sure their structures are in place for the kids um, to be able to have those opportunities, um, to give you their point of view, um, to be able to share um, how they're feeling, um, and have to be able to you know kind of collaborate with their classmates, but at the same time being able to give you information directly um, that maybe they don't want their classmates to necessarily hear. Um, so one of the things that I've done, and I know Mike included a slide here, um, is I have a daily check-in form in my classroom, um, which is a really good pulse on the social emotional state of my class. Um, how are they doing? How was their night? Did you eat breakfast? Um, you know, all those sorts of things are, are really good ways, I think, um, that I can kind of keep a pulse on my class. 
how they're doing individually, how they're doing as a class, and then I can kind of respond to those needs uh, from there. Thanks, Rob. We're gonna we're gonna get to that slide a little bit later. I thought I might zoom ahead and see if I could pull it up, but I, I think I'll wait for that. Sounds good. Sophie and Mary Grace, you know, can you can you talk a little bit to what you're doing lately that you know keeps the the kind of atmosphere of your classrooms, uh, both places I I'm quite familiar with, um, but keeps that feel alive for your kids. Yeah, so I think um, a big thing that Sophie and I were able to establish um, inviting classroom before all of this remote learning, which I think has now traveled over in such a positive way, where we have built routines and relationships with the kids, so they feel comfortable asking us questions. And I mean, by all means, it's not the same as it was in the classroom, but we're working towards getting it to be, you know, the same kids reaching out. We're trying to reach out to more of the kids in order for them to feel comfortable reaching out to us. So we have a bunch of students who are reaching out with questions or Sophie has a ton of kids who are just like, can I just talk with you for a little bit? And it doesn't necessarily have to be academics. And I think that's a huge thing as well, because I mean, being a math teacher, a lot of students are a little bit nervous. They don't they might not want to talk if they don't know exactly, you know, the type of teacher I am, they might not want to talk because they think I'm forcing them into doing math for that, you know, half an hour we're talking or whatever. So I think that's a big thing is being able to establish the relationships. And we did that prior to the remote learning. And now it's kind of carrying over, not quite at the level that we want it yet, but it's definitely improving daily, I would say with our um, connections with those students and making sure that they feel comfortable contacting us. And I think consistency too. We've been very consistent about reaching out to students. Um, I know I've been consistent with my special education students of meeting with them at the same times um, almost every day. Uh, and I've seen a huge response from um, specifically my special education students in attending those meetings and really speaking up um, and asking the questions, which typically in a larger classroom, um, we wouldn't really see, but because we've built that rapport and they're comfortable with that, they're continuing to do that virtually, which is uh, very nice to see. I had, um, just, you go ahead. can I, um, I that was in the chat. Yeah, go for it. So I saw, I was like, what about um, people who, you know, aren't reaching out and, you know, what are you doing about that in our team? Um, overall, we're in the middle school setting, so our team has been awesome with communicating with that. And Sophie and I actually just came from a group team meeting and having that connection, like we have strong connections with our house principal and our school counselor and relaying those messages of the students who you might not be connecting with that you're worried about, see what the other teachers are hearing and then bringing it to the school counselor and the principal and our school is doing a great job of making sure that we are trying to connect and find those kids that were, you know, might be, we might be losing in whether it's academically or social, emotionally, and mental health, we're trying to pick them up. So we're tracking as individual teachers and then bringing it as a team to figure out who we need to contact and maybe having that go outside of the teacher mode into the house principal or the school counselor to help us connect with them. I love that. And that's such a strength of the middle level. I'm curious, uh, Rob and Alicia, you know, at the elementary and at the high school level where the team's going to look a little different. Um, how, how are you managing the outreach to students who aren't engaging, who aren't responding to you guys? Well, I'm trying to vary my invitations a little more. Like, um, uh, as Sophie and Mary Grace were saying earlier, I, I, I relied really heavily on having some established routines that I could go, that I could lean on to keep kids engaged, move, trying to keep some of my assignments similar so that they, the routine would be a safety net for us. And um, But I, I still have found a number of students have sort of dropped off the radar or they over time are responding less and less. And so I've been in, in response to that, trying to extend additional invitations that maybe aren't even curriculum related. So sometimes that has looked like 
I'll do a little writing about the experience of living through COVID-19 and what I'm thinking about, and here's what a po poet said about it. Does anyone want to chat about that? And we'll have a little post on Google Classroom or we'll have a conversation. And um, because I've been thinking about, uh, you know, they're they're looking to us not only for curriculum work right now, which I think is important, of course, but also, you know, how how do people use writing and writing and mathematics to navigate a crisis? Mm -hmm. And so I've been trying to do a little bit of um, extending invitation by um, doing a little bit of my own processing with them in, in a sort of public way. And that has actually reached some of the students who initially kind of disappeared or didn't respond to the curricular work or did jump into the assigned group projects. They will, they have, um, several students have, who were quiet at first have emailed me and said, hey, thanks for posting that. It really helps to hear stuff. And, and then I, don't I never let those emails go. I respond and respond and respond and try to keep yeah, the conversation yeah, yeah. and connection going. Um, and that's happened a number of times. So I've I've really been trying to um, like the extending invitation is definitely a have from class, but I found I had to have uh, sometimes smaller and definitely varied invitations for students to um, I mean, sometimes it's, I've, I've even posted something that says, just, just click, turn it in if you've read this. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, the, just an invitation to just show me that you're out there and you're reading this. And then from there, I can kind of capitalize on it and reach out to the kids. I love that. I, you know, and I, so I, I think. I'm thinking about invitation. You know, I, I think it's it's to me it sounds like when those kids aren't responding to the first wave, to the second wave, um, you keep you know s stepping toward them, moving in their direction until they're they're you're close enough and they do connect, and then you don't retreat so much. You know, you, so I I appreciate that that flexibility and that responsiveness. Robin. Yeah, Mike, and I, I think yeah. that's very important. Um, the, you know, the communication piece, particularly with elementary kids, um, this has been a really eye-opening experience because um, what you start to learn, the more in communication you are with um, your your families and your students, is you know, there's unanticipated uh, things that pop up. You know, whether it's um, four kids at home with one computer or one device, and the inability to be on, um, two teachers maybe requesting your presence at the same time, and and being able to you know kind of navigate that, um, you know, um, I, I actually recently was trying to tutor um, my godson in Virginia, and I didn't realize just how bad my cousin, who's in her 50s, was bad at technology. And I just, it was eye-opening to me because I, I was trying to coach her through how to get onto something. And, you know, and I, it made me think, you know, I wonder how many of our parents at home are just not comfortable with some of this technology um, and what kind of roadblock that sets up for kids for kids, particularly at the elementary level. Um, so, you know, um, similar to what um, our other panelists were saying, you know, offering a variety of um, ways to, to connect. Um, I found that sometimes office, um, offering up office hours at different times of the day can be helpful um, to kind of counteract, uh, you know, knowing that maybe 9.30 is a coveted time to meet with kids on Google Meet. So I need to maybe do something a little bit later in the day. Yeah. Um, that's been uh, certainly um, helpful. I think also, um, you know, maybe going a little outside our comfort zone with the way that we have to communicate with some parents. You know, I have some parents who, you know, maybe don't check emails and, and they're only comfortable with a text message. And typically I wouldn't really want to be text messaging with kids, but in the, uh, with, excuse me, never with kids, but with, uh, <laughs> with parents. But um, I wouldn't want to be, uh, you know, texting with parents, but you know, that's the best way to communicate. And if that's what they need to help get their kid engaged in the learning, um, then, then whatever, we'll do what we have to do. So. Um, it's, you know, kind of um, made us as educators think outside the box um, in, in a variety of ways. Yeah, and that will be our understatement for, for today. I just want to draw the uh, attendees' attention to our slide. You know, um, Rob, and I, Rob, I think you, you, you added this uh, slide. So appreciate it. These are some of the extensions that you use, I think, in your Google Meet. Is that true? 
Uh, yes, I actually, I used the top two extensions. Um, the bottom two I just included um, just, you know, I, I don't know if it would be better um, for, you know, different uh, grade levels or whatever, the attendance one. Um, but yeah, the NOD extension is a big one. Um, and if you see it in the top left-hand corner, um, once you download the NOD extension, it gives, gives kids the ability to raise their hands um, if you they want to participate. So I, I'm guessing like all of you, um, I start my meetings by, you know, after chatting with the kids, asking everybody to mute. Um, and then the whole raising your hand feature is really um, a really good way to um, moderate your classroom. And then the little emoji where the thumb is, there's a bunch of emojis so the kids can react uh, to different things um, as you're speaking or as someone else is speaking. There's a little um, clapping emoji. There's like a thumbs up. There's, um, there's, there's, you know, the typical emojis that the kids can give feedback with. Um, and that's been very helpful. And then I found this other one on Sunday and I used, um, I used it actually for the first time yesterday. Um, and I don't know if everyone can see where my arrows are pointing, but um, the Google Meet Classroom extension um, gives you the ability um, to pull up a whiteboard while you're speaking. Um, so for math teachers or people who just want to quickly sketch something, um, it's a great, great um, thing to be able to use. Previously, I was um, pulling up a Google Jamboard and then sharing my screen and then I'm navigating tabs and it just felt like a lot. So um, this has been, you know, two days in of using this with math instruction, um, the little whiteboard feature has been very helpful. Um, so these extensions um, are just, you know, I think Google is, is responding to, you know, kind of the feedback of teachers and uh, I, was, I was glad to come across this and I hope it's useful for someone. I just, you know, want to zoom in a little bit on, on a screen that you shared with me. Um, and this is something that, you know, I, I'm relying on Rob a little bit uh, because you're a self-described technology enthusiast. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm tapping that passion of yours and sure. it's kind of showing some of the things that you've shared with me that you do that are, in this case, a daily schedule. You also have a weekly schedule. Um, can you talk a little bit about this particular feature? Sure. So um, I'm sure many people are familiar with um, they're familiar with Google Classroom. Um, so, you know, Google Classroom is the, the platform that we're um, pushing information to kids, um, assigning them things and, and whatnot. And um, one of the big things for me is always, you know, how am I keeping my kids engaged? I tried something uh, two weeks ago and I think I had four or five kids that actually um, jumped in and did it. And that didn't tell me that they you know, weren't doing their work. It told me that my method wasn't engaging enough for them. So um, I've been trying to um, vary my, um, methods to engage the kids and um, and also continue to keep some normalcy uh, from our normal uh, classroom. So, you know, one of the things we have is a, you know, a daily calendar at school with, you know, a flow of the day. This is what you can expect for your day. So I tried to keep that going through this um, daily Google message, um, you know, and then I kind of just type out what I want to do and I save it uh, to be scheduled the morning after. And then I kind of go back in with my phone and I add the emojis to Maybe, you know, draw attention to certain things, maybe look, make it look at least a little bit more appealing than, you know, the, the actual text would look by itself. I've been, and, um, and I try to play with different things to draw their attention every week. So for a while, um, I was doing just dad jokes, you know, I'm notoriously known for really cheesy jokes in my classroom. So uh, my students, you know, really look forward to that. Um, you know, they want to boo the jokes when I'm done with them, but at the same time, they crave them and miss them. So I put a dad joke on the bottom there. Um, and then, you know, to keep it interesting, um, I started um, doing a quote of the day and asking the kids to kind of respond to it in the comment section. Um, a couple weeks ago, uh, admittedly, I got bored. So I um, started putting like an intro paragraph in different languages. And I said, all right, you, you guys can decode this message, go to Google Translate and decode it. Um, and you know, whatever. So the kids get excited for little things like that. So I've been trying things um, to kind of keep them engaged. Um, and to answer your question, Mike, um, I do have this daily kind of schedule um, that kind of goes out, well, it does go out every day, but then I have a weekly schedule, um, which has been a really good thing um, for the kids and for the parents to know what's going on. Um, you know, it's funny when you talk to the parents and um, how little the kids actually want to talk about what they're doing in school. You know, you get your occasional, you know, kids, I think, who are like sharing every single thing you say all day long. But then there's other kids and you know, the parents are like, oh, wow, I had no idea this was happening. Um, so I think um, one positive um, in the weekly schedule is that the parents know exactly what's going on and they can know um, what the student is supposed to be doing. And um, it just helps to, you know, kind of, um, for lack of a better word, it just keeps them in the loop. Um, I'm noticing there's some chat comments here. Um, let's see if there's anything here. 
Someone wanted you to address the whiteboard extension. Uh, sure. So um, I'm just trying to find that comment. It I would. Don't see it, but I can talk about it. Um, oh, she yeah, there it is. Demonstrate, yeah. Oh, you want me to pull it up and show? Mm. Am I able to show my screen? Uh, you should. You should be able to. Um, that everyone, if this is a huge calamity, it's my fault. <laughs> Um, I'll tell you what, uh, how about, uh, rather than risk, um, messing up Mike's presentation and everything else, I can, I can kind of, um, address what, you know, how to do that after if, when we, maybe we can put a link, I can make a quick screencast video and put a link on Mike's website, um, that he created so that we can kind of show how to do that. Um, uh, I appreciate that. That's awesome. Problem. Hey, you know, I think one of the things we'll do too, depending on, uh, people's availability and inboxes, if, uh, Panelists are comfortable. We'll share emails um, if, if you're all right with that. And we'll talk about that afterwards so that people can keep connections going. Um, sure. Uh, you know, I'm just going to kind of shift us from the invitational learning environment to the second principle of engagement by design, relationships. And, you know, one of the things that they talk about are the conditions of healthy relationships. This won't come as a surprise to any of us that respect, trust, Communication, honesty are all essential. Um, and, you know, among many of the voices that speak in this chapter, um, they refer to Yuri Bronfenbrenner, who is a child psychologist. And we've heard other professionals in, in our educational work talk about the need for every child to have an adult who, who is that child's champion, who is just crazy about that kid. And Hattie reminds us in his 2009 seminal piece of meta-analysis that relationships have a very powerful effect size. If 0.44, according to Hattie's research, is the equivalent of 10 months of sound instruction and learning for a child, the effect size is almost twice that uh, when, when you talk about healthy, powerful relationships that exist between teacher and child. So um, I'm just going to, you know, go to this slide and, and pull up um, the daily check-in form that Rob alluded to a little while ago. That is not what I wanted to do. And so this check-in form here is something that's basic Google form, but Rob, why don't you take us through it real quick? Sure, basically just, um, you know, the kid's email address gets collected, their student number, um, the day of the week. Um, sometimes what I'll do is, depending on the date and the day of the week, um, it will redirect them to different things. Um, so on every Friday I do a reflection. Um, so, you know, uh, the kids can kind of reflect on what was the best part of their week, what was something that wasn't so great. Um, I always check in, I ask them what they do um, the night before, I ask them what they had for breakfast. Um, I ask them kind of like to rate them how they're feeling on, um, on a mood scale. Um, during the year, sometimes I'll link this mood scale to, you know, if I'm somebody who's down in the lower one through four, you know, maybe just give them something to consider doing, you know, write down your feelings in a journal, go do some jumping jacks, you know, to do, do something to get the blood flowing. Um, so that's kind of um, gives me a pulse on their social emotional um, status. Like I said before on the bottom, what day of the week is it? Um, depending on the day, it might read the survey might redirect them to something else. Um, like I said, Friday reflection, um, and so forth. So um, this has been really good for me at home, um, because there's been kids who have shared things with me, um, you know, that things that they're frustrated about, maybe things that um, they're grappling with, with being home and just, you know, not being able to see their friends and not being able to see their grandparents and, you know, it gives them a place to kind of vent. And it's also a place where, you know, I can take a look at it and, and then I can shoot them an email and say, hey, you know, let's talk about this. Hey, have you talked about this with your parents? Um, so it's been a really good um, um, entry point to, to get into, you know, the kids and, and where they're thinking at that given day, on that given day. Awesome. Uh, before we, we move towards clarity, I just wanted to, to check in with Alicia. Um, you know, we've talked a lot um, about uh, how relationships get tested uh, when, you know, you're working remotely. 
and um, you alluded to some of the things that you're doing. Any anything that's kind of been a challenge in particular or a surprise for you? I mean, I have a couple of challenges. Um, I'm trying to see them as affirmation of the things I'm doing well. Uh, I'll give you an example. I think one of the things we talked about in sort of preparing for the meeting. Um, two of my classes are uh, elective uh, that are seniors are taking alicia i'm gonna um, alicia i'm gonna step in just a little bit at 7 30 in the morning and it was a cinema as literature class and i only had those students for about four weeks before school and uh and so uh or pause, pause. alicia can i can you hear me sure What's up? I think your your connection's a little glitchy. So I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to you. I don't know if there's a place that you have a little bit better Wi-Fi connection, Is but I want you to free you up just to see if you can get a little bit better connection. I'll come back to you in a little bit. So Mary Grace and I Sophie, either one of you. Too. Yeah. She's going to hop on a different device and then pop back in. Thank you. Appreciate it, Jerome. Sophie or Mary Grace, either either of you want to talk a little bit about, you know, how how you're maintaining those relationships. You alluded to it before a little bit. I know, Sophie, your kids um, are are finding ways to want to connect with you outside of your co-taught math class with Mary Grace. Can you talk a little bit about the typical exchanges you're experiencing with kids? Yeah, um, my biggest concern was because we're co-teaching, um, although I'm the special education teacher in the room, um, I worried that I would lose my connection with the gen ed students that I've, you know, take, they're still my students. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised when I would reach out to some that they would respond right back. Um, I've had a few reach out and want to just chat um, I had a, like a 30 minute conversation with um, one of our students who's in our co-taught classes and she just wanted to talk to me about how two dogs randomly showed up um, on her mom's back porch that day and I could lead her to saying oh wouldn't that be great for your language arts writer's notebook this week to do to write about um, so I can kind of still <laughs> get them engaged in their learning but still have those fun conversations um, and then my special education students have really been showing up on Google Meet and they love it and they interact with one another just like they were would in the classroom. Um, they have they call each other by their little nicknames um, or they share we often me and my special ed co teacher um, will often allow them to share their screen and sometimes they share out a funny meme that they have they found um, or something ridiculous video or sound effect. Um, so giving them that time in the beginning of our meeting before we kind of crack down into what do you, what do you have to do this week um, or today is kind of fun and it lets us still have that funny kind of banter back and forth that we usually have in the classroom. So, And it's a reminder, of, you know, it's surprising for some reason to, to, to all of us how much our kids just need to connect with us. Um, we aren't always aware of the space we occupy in their lives um, as adults who clearly for them seem like people who care and that becomes the bedrock under circumstances like this for them to remain engaged if for no other reason than to just be with you to have those conversations and you masterfully steer it back towards an academic focus when the opportunity is there you seize it um, i'm going to uh i'm going to shift over towards talking about the next principle of engagement by design which is clarity and there are clear kinds of clarity that the authors are, are focusing in on clarity of organization um, which has to do with tasks and outcomes 
of explanation that it's relevant, accurate, and comprehensible to our kids, that the guided practice and examples are strongly connected to what we've said is the learning we have in mind for that particular lesson. And there is clarity of assessment that we are constantly seeking that feedback from kids. And it's both verbal, it's written, it's in any mode that makes the most sense, depending on that learner's strengths and the skills and content we're working with. But what really rings true with clarity isn't so much that we as teachers know what it is we're trying to do, but that anybody who comes in and talks to our students will hear students be able to say exactly what we'd say that it's that clear to kids that they can speak with precision with accuracy and with confidence that they know what it is they're trying to learn they know when they're getting it <laughs> and evidence of that they know the kind of help they need and they know that the teacher can provide it and not just the teacher but other peers in that room who are reaching levels of mastery. Uh, for Hattie, this is huge as well because clarity of instruction has a huge effect size for kids. You know, lots of times we have that learning target, we establish it as soon as we start thinking about a unit, we know what our big targets are. Um, but really all along the way, we're trying to provide feedback and feedback is our effort to close that gap between current student performance and the outcomes we ultimately hope for them. But, you know, feedback becomes far less effective when students aren't clear about what it is we're, we're after and what it is we're trying to learn, and they can put it in those words. So success criteria, and you see a couple of examples to the right, and basic math example, uh, basic ELA example where we've got goals and, and there are the success criteria. And for a lot of us, you know, we have the day's learning target in mind, but our success criteria might really be carryovers from the general description of the unit that we're working on. Um, we need to make sure that our, our success criteria are really specific to the lesson that day. So if the lesson's you know, a social studies lesson at the middle level about using maps and reading maps accurately, those success criteria should be very specific to the elements of map reading, that we understand the legend, that we understand how to use and apply the scale, so that those success criteria are specific. And when they are, and directly connected to that learning target, the clarity of the lesson becomes super clear and much more effective. It also allows kids to self-monitor their progress towards that learning target. And you know, when, when we experience this as teachers, we can hear our kids say, I want another shot at that. Or um, if this is where I'm at right here, then by the end of the week, I really feel like I'm gonna be able to do this. That kind of goal setting, when we get to that point with kids and we hear that language coming from kids, that's very powerful. Hattie will tell us that it triples the speed and depth of learning so that you know we maintain that the longer we maintain that it's not just one year's worth of academic growth that child will experience in your class it's close to three even more so so i'm going to pause for a second I've, I've got another example for rob here but you know just thinking a little bit about clarity and before i go to you rob mary grace sophie when you think about the efforts you take knowing the full array of students who are in your class um, what, what are what are the things you're discovering about trying to make a learning target and steps towards that instruction clear to kids under this context of remote instruction so um sophie and i've talked about it in we've talked about it also with the uh, math eight collaborative team so i work with math eight team and an algebra team and pretty much things are changing weekly um at the beginning you know we had our assignments and we had multiple videos multiple practice thing all this stuff going on you know two quick assignments and we were like oh this is very like to us it was very clear and then we're taking that student feedback which might not be uh, an email of i'm confused but it's uh 
I only submitted a one assignment or the student only watched one video and I can tell they only watched one of those videos. So it became, you know, even though we tried to spell it out very clear in our assignments and we do um, a weekly thing kind of like what um, Rob's weekly calendar is, except for it's just for math and it's, this is required, you know, this is your extra help. And then the extensions, which was a really cool um, opportunity that one of the, one of our colleagues kind of suggested that we do as well. And we realized that, you know, we should probably narrow this down to one video because for eighth graders, you know, they see a bunch of things and they're just gonna click around and go through, even if we spell it out and color coordinate and bold and underline, it's, it wasn't helping. So we were like, all right, you know, let's do one instructional video with our notes, practice to go along with that, one assignment, you know, keep it very simple for the students. They're able to see that and trying to keep it as simple for them and then kind of going along with making sure that we're modifying our assignments too. Sophie and I talk about, well, what do we want the students who, you know, have those modified curriculums, what do we want them to get out of this assessment? So it's modifying that down to what do we want them to do, which they're doing phenomenal with that because Sophie's been working with them one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, it might be a completely different lesson, but that's okay. It's what do we want them to know? So it's trying to level that out as well as giving the extensions and the challenges that we did in class, but as well as, you know, working with our team of math teachers and figuring out, okay, what else can they learn from this? So it, it definitely changes weekly on what we're doing, but that's coming from what the student feedback is. And when I work one-on-one -on -one with kids and when Sophie works one on one, we try to figure out like, all right, what is working with these students? What is not working? And then making, you know, the next week's assignment based on that. So I think that's a pretty, you know, interesting thing about how, uh, you know, the clarity of our assignments has changed based on like, okay, what's the feedback from the students and how clear is it actually to the students? Is it clear? It's clear to us. The color coordination looks lovely, but to them, it's, it's not as clear. So it's trying to get that feedback in a, in a way where, you know, they might not be telling us that, but we can see that they're only doing one of two assignments or whatever that happens to be. And trying to give them, I mean, we were trying to do a variety of ways of assessment, but that's another thing we were like, well, well you know, we, they must be getting sick of this way, so we're getting sick of this, but now we've kind of been on the same track of having them show their work for the math problem and just submitting two to four questions a week and that's it. And um, we're, we're trying to move away, but now I'm almost like, well, they're used to this and they're doing really well with this. Do we change it? Do we not? And that kind of becomes an issue too of, well, do we, you know, change that and see what become, what else can be clear for them as far as instruction. So it's kind of going with, you know, what the students are doing and how they're doing with the assignments based on what we're going to do for the next week. And it's just all about that feedback from them. I don't know, Sophie, if you wanted to add anything to that. Sorry, long-winded. You know, that's perfect, Mary Grace, because I, I just, I couldn't think of a better example of the natural evolution when your space is changed. You know, it's, it's not just like, well, you know, you're not going to be in your typical classroom for the next month, for the next six weeks. Um, we haven't changed your space just in that little way. We've altered the entire landscape. And so you tried to translate as much as you could of the kinds of approaches and strategies that would normally work. And you realized not that it wasn't helpful, but it wasn't enough. And it was like a goat rodeo until you said, okay, <laughs> too many shiny things to look at. I, we have mm -hmm. to narrow. Yeah. There's a question in the chat for Mary Grace. It says, can you please repeat the structure you use for your class? I hear one instructional video practice and then. So what we typically try to do, um, and we kind of, it's kind of nice because so there's four algebra teachers in our school and three math eight. And that's the awesome thing about middle school and the teaming aspect is that like, I'm pretty much either collaborating on a lesson with you know, three, two to three other teachers, sometimes more when the special ed, when we have the questions for special ed and I'm only, you know, making one every so like, every so often which is awesome too but what we're trying to do with our math eight students and those are kind of the um 
not advanced kids is do one instructional video that goes along with, so we use Loom and um, Cami to help us with that, the extensions to write down and talk through the notes with the kids, the way that we usually set up the notes in school, because um, we like to make our own. And then we go through a couple practice, and then we usually just give an assignment. So we try to do notes in practice on one page with an instructional video, and then it, just an assignment. We've been doing just a Google Doc with a couple questions and walking them. They walk through those on their own after, hopefully after they watch the video and do the notes, which isn't always the case, but you can usually <laughs> tell by the assignment that they haven't watched the video. So then you write a little note, please watch the video. Um, <laughs> or we have those students too who, I know Sophie knows they're not going to watch the video and they barely paid attention in class. So it's like, all right, we have those weekly times where we set up with those kids and we get that work done. Um, 20 minutes to a half an hour, we're doing the math together. So it gives them that opportunity to be successful. Even They might not follow all the instructions, but we have those handful of kids that we do that with. I think, I hope that answers the question. Try yeah. to keep it as simple as possible for now. We're looking to expand, but it's been a challenge for both us and the kids, I think, with that. You know, I, I, I'm reminded of a conversation I had with you, Alicia, and I think it might have been your SUPA class, um, but it was uh, the assignment that you chose, instead of having kids work on it separately, you created a collective Google Doc. And um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, first of all, can you hear me? Yes, you sound and okay. look wonderful. Okay, okay, great. So I just I switched to devices, so hopefully this will work better. But um, yeah, one of the things that I was finding was um, similar to what Mary Grace was saying. Students were overwhelmed by the amount of material that I was giving them, which was still much less that I would have been giving them in person. But I, I wasn't there to help them navigate some of the material, and it was it was becoming overwhelming. So I had to let go of some of my very favorite activities that we do toward the end of the year that I had been sort of building up to. And that was a little bit of a painful process to me because um, I knew we were building towards some kind of like abracadabra moments. Look what we did now that we have all these layered. So I had to sort of let that go. And um, I um, I did, I made two moves. One was to help to provide clarity on the topic um, that we were working with, uh, some, the class is about, uh, um, is about reading literature through the lens of socioeconomic class. So um, one move I made was to pull in some contemporary articles because COVID-19 obviously has some issues of socioeconomic class sort of writ large in, in them. So I, I pulled those in to help students sort of um, see how relevant the work that they're doing is. Um, they, some, they don't always see it when it's, when we're doing that work on a short story, but when I, you know, steer them in the direction of a current event or an article from last night's New York Times, um, they're able to see, the, they get um, a little clarity about our purpose, I think. So that was one move that I made. And um, the other is I, I took one of our articles that we, re, we, go over together. It's actually a TED talk by um, Kimberly Crenshaw about intersectionality. And they usually would have had this uh, um, kind of a, well, a structure that I've used over and over. I wouldn't quite call it a worksheet, but they have to do like a, a, a critical reading of the theory. It's, a, it's like a 20 minute TED talk and then pick a few flashpoints where they would um, look closely at one sentence or one paragraph of what she had said and they would do a little analysis. And um, I just decided that that would be way too overwhelming for them to take on by themselves. Usually that would be something that they would be doing in class and I'd be walking around and talking to them. They be supporting each other. Um, so what I decided to do was create one document that had all of those features, but then to share that document with two classes. So there were 40 students working on the document, actually, and they sort of teamed up to, to look at different sections, say, minute one through four of the video or, you know, five through seven of the video. I didn't put them in their groups. They got in their own groups. And um, and then we created this 
I think it would, in the end, it was maybe seven or eight page analysis together of the work. And you really could see that the students felt um, they understood what the purpose was. It was the, the, the purpose of the assignment. I explained to them that they would be using that assignment when it was completed, we'd all be able to use it to guide our work on the final project that we're gonna do. So it was a document that we're gonna be using again. Um, and then we were able to return to this that, that assignment and uh, make comments in the margin to each other to support each other's work. So it really felt like they were clear that this wasn't just a thing for Miss Wine to read, but it was a document that was, it had a purpose and they were clear that we're all gonna be using it together. And those couple of shifts were things that I hadn't thought to do in my, exactly like that in my classroom, because I had a way that worked okay. It seemed, it seemed to be fine. Um, <laughs> but these circumstances pushed me to, to think about, well, is there another way that we can meet those same goals and to keep them, not not simple but clear, um, and I don't know. I think that was that was one success that uh, of uh, you know having to do some rethinking. Um, it really helped. Ah, oh, and I I, it, it, I don't want to zoom ahead, but that's something that we might return to a little later in our discussion when we think about on the other side of this pandemic. Um, things that we hope to retain, changes in our practice, um, that stands out as something that sounds like it's found a place in your work going forward. Um, Rob, it, it actually, but, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say it actually really influenced how I set up my, um, what is going to be my final project for my ninth graders too, because I just, it's a thing that I, I have learned before and I, Sorry, my dogs are barking. Um, I, I, and I, I sort of knew it, but I, it slips my mind if I don't keep it in my regular practice, is that they're very moved by and invested in each other's words. Mm. And, um, and I, th I know that when we're doing writing workshops, but I don't think of it as much when we're doing analysis, really. So um, because I saw them really investing in what they were saying in that assignment, I set up my ninth grade final project so that um, to warm up for the project, I had them answer a few questions about their experience doing distance learning. And I asked them, you know, what's the difference between learning and doing school? And that was a very lucrative Great prompt. They had question. a lot. Yeah, they had a lot to say about that. And that actually got a few kids in the conversation who really had not been. And I went through all of their writing and just, and I pulled things out of their writing. I pulled quotes from Kiara and Destiny and, um, you know, and that is the first page of our final assignment is all these quotes from them about the purpose of learning and what it means to be engaged and what are the, what are the assignments they care about. And um, then I, I, I hope that's helping me to launch this assignment in a way that they can really see that it's an invitation, but it's an invitation that has has a clarity of purpose and that I have um, really listened to what they had to say about what was important in their learning. And um, they seem to be, I just handed out the assignment today and they seem to be pretty motivated that I got a lot of questions today about like, would it be okay if we did this? Would can we do this? Can I make a video instead? And the questions, although maybe they sounded a little overwhelmed, they also sounded excited. And I think that um, that's going to go a long way in the current circumstance when you can't get a kid who's not excited. You can't just like go sit by them and like <laughs> just give them. Oh, come on! I know you love video games. Let's talk about video games. You know, you can't you can't grab onto those things in this circumstance and that sort of those easy ways we nudge them to be motiv motivated. Um, and and this seems to be helping with that that sort of move toward clarity. So you know, before we move on, I just the striking thing that that I heard in, in your description was you use the actual words from Kira and, and Destiny. They're, mm -hmm. You were quoting kids. They, their thinking, their experience was front and center in, in, this, yes. in this work. You know, not that you need to know this, but all of the research right now coming from colleagues across the country um, is that 
we have to be masters of relevance, especially at this point, but always um, when we're working with our kids, we need to know mm -hmm. enough about the lives they lead outside of school to, to, to catch glimpses of who they are separate from their academic identity. Mm -hmm. And when that stuff becomes front and center of the work that they're doing, that relevance leads to very, very powerful engagement, the kind that you're mm -hmm. describing. Um, mm -hmm. That's pretty awesome. You know, Rob, I, I, I'm glad uh, we got you viewable again. And I just, I, I wanted to go uh, to your weekly calendar. It's going to ask me to make a copy. And um, this worked earlier today. And if it doesn't work, I just try it again and it works. But it's working. Perfect. I'll let you go ahead and speak to it. Sure. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I know and, and thinking about, um, you know, kids who have a variety of needs, you know, kids who might um, struggle organizationally and things like that, you know, typically something we'll do in a classroom is maybe make like a checklist for them or give them some sort of organization support. Um, so um, when we made this um, calendar, you know, I, I'm very much um, in collaboration with the rest of my fifth grade team. Um, we wanted to make it so that um, it did kind of look like a checklist so that if there's a parent at home who wants to print it out for a kid who needs to be able to go through and say, I did this, check, I did this, check, I did this, check, um, that would be an option. So a very simple thing that we added um, to um, this form that I think is um, based evidence for the kids' organization and things like that. Um, the top part of this form um, where you see there is just kind of um, our morning meetings. Every morning we have a meeting, we do a read aloud, just like we do in school. Uh, for me, the best part of my day with my kids is usually the read aloud uh, because of the questions that they ask and the discussions that we um, are able to have, um, the things that come up, the issues we can address. Um, so that has been great. Um, speaking of clarity, um, you might notice on Tuesday, it says we have a special guest uh, person joining in today. Um, and what's been happening in our district is a lot of the special areas, you know, um, fine arts, music, PE, et cetera, have been um, creating online lessons and things as well. And um, in, in, the name of, in, in the name of, you know, clarity and making sure that um, everybody's, you know, these, everyone's seeing the kids, um, I've been inviting the special area teachers to come in and pop in and kind of walk the kids through their website and walk them through how to get to some of these lessons. Um, and I think that's been really helpful for them to see their other teachers that they normally see once, twice, three times a week. Um, but also, you know, um, good for the other teachers to kind of have that contact with the kids. Um, I love that idea. Say it again. I love that idea. <laughs> Thank you. I definitely stole that from one of my colleagues and it was a fa fabulous idea. So we definitely wanted to make sure we, we started doing that. And it's it's been great um, just to have them involved. Um, you know, and I think uh, our principal, who's also watching this, hi, Chris, um, is going to be a special uh, guest uh, next week, too. And he maybe he'll come in. Maybe he'll want to read some of our read aloud. I don't know. We'll see. Um, we kind of put um, the priorities in the district, you know, for in terms of number of X number of hours of math, X num number of hours of ELA. Um, so we've kind of divided the calendar or this weekly schedule into that. Um, so there's a video they have to watch. And, um, you know, due to confidentiality of some kids and things like that, I had to unlink some of them, but the ones that are linked are things that you can actually see, um, including the daily check-in form. Um, but anyhow, so there's a video they have to watch. I try to do some sort of formative thing for me so that quickly I can see whether or not they're getting the concept in math. Um, so what we've been doing the last couple of weeks is a Google form um, where the kids input the answers um, and it tells them immediately how they're doing. Um, the tricky thing with that is you have to anticipate any answer the kid might give you. So if it's if the answer is 15.2 kilograms, you know I have to put 15.2 kg, 15.2 kilograms, 15.2 kg with no space in between the 15.2 and the kg. Because you have to <laughs> anything that they're gonna do. Because the first thing that's gonna happen is, hey, uh, this marked me wrong, and I know I'm right. And really, it's just because there's not a space. Um, so anyhow, so we've been kind of going through and doing that. We're, we for math, we've been doing three lessons a week, and then at the end of the week for. Um, usually Thursday or Friday, we've been trying to, and I don't know if there's one on here, um, we've been trying to ask the kids to make a Seesaw video. Um, Seesaw is linked to the parent um, email addresses and the parents have access, so they actually have to explain um, their work. Um, yeah, there it is. So they can choose a problem, explain their work um, with their words, with the uh, drawing tool. Um, so, you know, if all week, you know, I'm doing really well, but I don't do well when I have to explain it, then okay, now it's time to check in and see what's going on. So um, that's kind of math, and I try, you might see my Bitmoji mixed in again, trying to just make it more um, visually appealing for the kids. Um, I've been running book clubs um, for 
reading, which allows me to differentiate um, based on my students, um, you know, reading level. Um, I can get, differentiate their writing assignments based on that. Um, I've also been starting to, um, you know, have different times, um, scheduled times for book clubs and scheduled times for math check-in. Um, thankfully, uh, one of our teacher assistants has been um, great about um, starting to like run her own groups at this point too. So it's great. So she could be doing that. I could be doing ELA. Um, it's a wonderful luxury uh, that I am not taking for granted, but uh, certainly that's how I've been running my groups. Um, and then um, down in the bottom, just the way that I've kind of organized it is just optional things. You know, I, you, you always have kids in every class who get done with whatever work you give them in 35 seconds. And, you know, we want to make sure that we have other options for kids um, to challenge them. So um, this is just, um, you know, a little sampling of some of the other things that they could be working on. Um, I definitely tried to throw in some things like do some chores at home, um, and the parents are very happy about that one. <laughs> um, now, I also, on my Google Classroom, have a whole challenge section as well, so kids can go in and do that sort of stuff. Um, but anyhow, that's kind of just the organization there. And then down on the bottom, it's just the special area stuff. It's, you know, PE, and um, the special areas are musts. So what I've done is Monday through Thursday, it's kind of we do all our core content, math, ELA work. And if you have a chance, do your PE. If you have a chance, do your music. If you don't have a chance, use Friday as a catch-up day. Go and do that art lesson. Go and spend 30 minutes outside. Do those things outside. Work hard up front so that at the end of the week, you can kind of do what you need to do. So um, that's kind of the gist of this uh, sample schedule. It's been, it's been successful so far. And, you know, when the kids get bored of it, I'll have to think of something else. But for now, it's working. And I just want to remind... Uh everybody who's attending that you're going to be able to at the close of our webinar today receive via email a link to our Google site. Um, as I showed you at, at the outset, there is a, a page where we feature this slide deck. You'll be able to go to this slide, you'll be able to click on this link and, and check out in greater detail some of the work that Rob is sharing with us. Uh, Mike, there were two questions in the chat. Can I just address those quick? Yes, absolutely. Um, there was one question about um, explaining what Flipgrid is. Um, Flipgrid is kind of a way for the kids to create video responses um, to whatever it is that you're asking them to respond to. Um, you saw it a few times there in my weekly schedule. Um, what the kids like about it is that, um, you know, the, the kids who may be hesitant uh, to write or, or, you know, maybe have a hard time getting their thinking down on paper or typing it out. Um, it just allows them to speak. So we get a lot more output from kids when they're making their own videos. Um, Flipgrid is great because it gives a time limit. So you could say, answer this question in a minute, or what is the theme of this book? Um, you know, give me an example from the text. You have a minute and 30 seconds. So, um, you know, every video, you know, I try not to make them too long because every video you assign, you know, you want to watch and give feedback. Um, so if you're letting them be five minutes and you have 20 kids, there's a hundred minutes all of a sudden that's gone. But, um, Flipgrid is great for that sort of thing. Um, and then there was another question. I'm sorry. Oh, and uh, Maureen asked if it was under the stream or under classwork. Um, I put it as a link to my daily announcement in the stream every single day. So it's the same link. Um, and actually uh, what that is, is it's a Google Doc, the weekly schedule. And I published it to the web so that any changes that I make, um, it kind of looks like a website, sort of. Um, everything is clickable. Um, but once you publish it to the web and you copy and paste that link, um, just like you would a normal Google Doc, it makes it um, a little more aesthetically pleasing um, for, for the kids and for the parents. Thank you for that explanation. Sure. I'm going to go quickly through this fourth principle challenge. And, uh, you know, in, in several different ways, people have already spoken to it. So especially now with remote learning, the place where challenge or struggle with instructional content should occur is definitely in the presence of the teacher. Um, so whether our instruction is happening asynchronous, asynchronously through a recorded module that we're sharing via Google Classroom, or whether it's a synchronous session, that's where we're introducing the new material and the challenge. But when we let go of our kids, anything we ask them to do beyond that, we need to make absolutely sure that they, they've shown enough of an understanding that they can make an independent attempt. And that's really the purpose of that independent work is for additional practice with the knowledge and skills that have already happened in your presence. And, you know, I think when we talk about challenge, you know, we're discovering 
in, in our instruction that no matter how well we organize it, how clear we are in our instructions, um, kids are going to show us through their feedback where the gaps are. And we've heard that adage in the past, less is more, less is more. And I think this is especially true of challenge. Um, we have to be really precise about how we're going to introduce challenge and the ways we're going to ask kids to take it on. One of the things I like about the chapter that um, our authors talk about challenge is they break it down into two basic components and it might seem self-explanatory, but when we talk about difficulty, they're explicit in saying they're referring to the amount of work or time, the effort that the learner has to exert. And that's how they define difficulty. Complexity is the type of thinking, the number of steps, or the necessary, necessary background or knowledge required of the task. And then they render it in this quadrant. And you can see how things go from easy to hard, less and more complex. And they break it into these descriptive areas. Strategic thinking, fluency, stamina, struggle. We're after all of these things. But when we talk about strategic thinking, they want low difficulty with high complexity. When we talk about fluency, they want low difficulty, low complexity. It's how we learn to tie our shoes and how we tie them today. Fluency is that state where very little head time is required to pedal the pedals and remain upright, not crash the bike. Um, when we're introducing complex and difficult work, we are right in that upper right quadrant of struggle. And that's where we really need to slow down. We really need to simplify. And I think this grid kind of makes it clear and keeps us conscious and keeps us asking ourselves for the learner, how is this particular task striking them? Gonna, um, I think yeah, go ahead, Alicia. Um, I was just thinking too that, um, one thing perhaps the grid doesn't keep or the graph doesn't exactly account for in, in our current situation is that it's not difficulty and complexity isn't necessarily static in that um, for example our current cultural issues have just sort of shoved us all up into the right <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know about other people, but I know that, you know, the first week we were home from school and we were coping with the, you know, international trauma, everything seemed complex to me, including doing the dishes or, <laughs> you know, taking the dogs outside. Um, and the, and we all have, we haven't all recovered from that and, and we haven't all recovered at the same rate. So I'm finding there's, a, um, the places I knew for sure were where I had to meet a challenge with a student before. It's, it's not the same place anymore. So there's a lot of um, recalibrating that has to be done. There, um, and I just wanted to just interject that because I just, I, I realized, oh I, yeah, I'm in a different spot on that grid and I haven't uh, changed uh, anything. <laughs> that is such a beautiful way to put uh, the, the phenomenon we're experiencing that you said so well you know, the world has halted. So what might have been something we did with great fluency before has now thrown itself into that upper right-hand quadrant um, because so many things are uncertain. And when we're feeling that level of uncertainty every day and nothing feels familiar, it changes all of it. And that's the lens we need to be looking through when we talk about challenge. That's perfect, thank you. And Mike, can I just uh, add on, I think thank another you. additional challenge that, you know, looking forward into the future, maybe maybe the, hopefully the fall, um, is, you know, the fifth graders are gonna be, you know, moving on to middle school and the kids I teach, and there's gonna be things that we normally do this time of year that they're not gonna get to do. And I think middle school teachers then pausing and saying, all right, let's take a step back. Let's just get them where they should have been or, or where we wanted them to be and just keep that in mind. And same thing for the middle schoolers going to the high school. You know, there's going to there's gonna be a little bit of um, that, I think, occurring. And I think we just need to be um, cognizant of that moving forward. It, the way I hear all of those comments together is that when, before we contemplate challenge, we need to assess where we're at. Where are we right now? What do we need? And there are a whole bunch of ways we're going to need to be able to do that when we return after all of this 
allows us to be in our classrooms with our children again. Thank you. I'm going to shift uh, with the time that we have remaining, just talk uh, briefly, but hopefully well, <laughs> about the three main principles of universal design for learning. And all universal design refers to is anytime we create something, we're creating that thing with all of the potential users or people who are going to interact with that thing in mind. And that first principle of representation just says, we try to talk about, we try to represent, we try to provide what it is that we're setting in front of ourselves to learn in as many modes as possible. So it gives kids as many different ways to access the material as possible, especially when we're aware of their learning strengths and we make those appeals, we, we design modes that appeal to their learning strengths. Action and expression, that we give kids more than one way to interact with that material and to show their learning. Um, so it's not just a standard quiz. Um, it's not only an oral explanation, but we're trying to give as many different ways, depending on the strengths of our kids, to help them elicit what they know. And engagement, as many different ways to, multi, to, to motivate students. Um, that's you know, where you know, we try to find things that capture relevance to what they're experiencing right now. And, and I think you're hearing in some of the previous comments panelists are making that they're trying in every possible way to create that relevance. That link at the bottom just takes you to a site that you know, gives really good explanations of these principles in practice. You know, the benefits are clear. Um, we, we definitely are, are having kids in general education settings more and more. And um, when we give choice to every child, uh, it, it makes, kids who would otherwise be terribly self-conscious about any accommodation, any modification, less visible. And they feel more of a way of, uh, less visible for any deficit they might feel. And they feel more visible as a member of that classroom. We're looking to adapt our instruction and our content to the learner instead of the other way around. We're giving kids more than one way to interact with that material. And again, it's all about strengths. And this really ties in with that other idea, a variety of options to all students. It means we're not singling out kids who have IEPs, 504s. We know that the average child is a myth and we can't design instruction for an average anything that when we consider our, our, our class rosters, we think about our edges, for lack of a better term, our students who are ready to be challenged. They live and breathe how we typically do instruction. Um, this is their wheelhouse. And we have our students who aren't just challenged now, they think about school as a place where they constantly feel several steps behind. When we think about those two far aspects of, of our class roster and we design our instruction to capture, no matter where those edges are, everybody who falls in between is going to have an entry. So, you know, I, I'm just going to, before we, I, I want everybody to admire my, my GIF for a second. But uh, before we, we launch forward, I just want to, talk a little bit or let panelists talk a little bit about the challenges you're facing as you're thinking about your kids and your roster and um, how are you feeling in terms of meeting the needs of those kids? I think teachers probably all feel the same way. Like we're working our tails off, but it never feels like enough. It always feels like there's more to do. There always feels like there's something else we can be doing. Um, but I know we're all trying uh, to do the best we can to meet their needs at, at whatever cost is necessary. Yeah, I saw some things in the chat that um, you know people are having a hard time with the assessments and stuff. And Sophie, you can probably talk on the special ed aspect. Um, there's a question on that. But as far as like trying to track the students and figure out, you know, what do they know and 
from the assessments has it take one takes up a lot of time just because you're trying to track who hasn't done it too um so mm -hmm. it's definitely something that sophie and i are finding as a challenge but we're trying to um i'm a big like google sheets google documents person so before we, we have our system where we input grades but we're trying to track um via like google sheets and stuff that's a big thing that we're trying to work with and figure out that helps us figure out okay who you know has done the assignment well who have we returned the assignment back to and we need them to make some edits we might need to contact them to make edits and who has not done the assignment at all and that's a big thing about how um, we're kind of assessing that and we're trying to make it you know it's easy on the kids as possible like I said just like a couple questions figuring out their level and it's it's a challenge and um, we thought it was going to be more of a challenge when it was no numerical grade but we're kind of finding that it's been easier with that because the numerical grade I think has its view in the world and it's not you know, an 80 for some kids, you know, it's, it's different depending on the student and depending on their modifications or whatever it happens to be. But we're finding that, you know, if there are district is doing demonstrated evidence of learning or has not demonstrated evidence of learning. And it's kind of like, it was a challenge at the beginning. Like, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? And I know Bev's in here. Sorry, Bev. We kind of were like, what, what do you want us to do? Like, can you please help us with this? Like, I don't, we don't know this, but I think as it goes, Sophie and I have really come to know like, oh, well, we know this student. This is this student demonstrating evidence learning or this is this student. This student has, no, this is not, you know, acceptable work for this student. And we have to make sure of their circumstances too. And that's the thing. A lot of the evidence of learning has changed for, you know, our high level stu higher level students who now we're finding out about their home situations. So we have to be mindful of that when we're grading them as well. And, um, so that's kind of been a huge challenge for us, I know, but we're trying something different each day and each week. Yeah, Mary Grace and I, because we co-teach together, obviously, and I also co-teach science. Um, so I'm trying to help out as much as possible in keeping track of grades and where all the students are at. Um, so what's been very helpful is creating that Google Sheet, like she said, where we um, type in where the students are all at before we put it into our grading system online to tell their parents um, or so they can see because then there's less chaos of, I thought my child did this or wait, they said they submitted this. Um, we can really kind of take our time and make sure we're both on the same page of, of who we need to reach out to to get that extra support. Um, and it's, I think Mary Grace made, also made a nice point of the numerical grading kind of being gone. Um, is is from a special ed standpoint kind of nice because an 85 for my modified curriculum student means a completely different thing from an 85 for a student who has no modifications um so del and what we've used um which is demonstrated evidence of learning is kind of easier because i know that that student has worked to receive that del and it might not look the same as the other student but that's okay um so it's it's kind of been a nice shift almost mm. I found that very freeing as well, actually, I'm sort of unexpectedly so that uh, I guess it's always true that every student's assignment doesn't have to look exactly the same, but I do, you know, tend to give the same assignment to the whole class and then tweak it for individual students. And um, because of the freedom from that grade, I've gone into a couple of projects just thinking, well, Mm, I know this student really hates to work in groups, so let's just not have her do it this time. And I just emailed her and we had a conversation about the work and I made sure she understood it while somebody else who's great working in groups worked in a group. And I just, it's, it sort of freed me up. Um, you know, I think it can be kind of a trap to think in those numbers that it's that that, that it, it it regiments some of your um, assignments uh, in a way that they don't need to be. And so the fact that I just have to, know whether they're demonstrating some evidence of learning has meant I've been able to give give some of that up and tailor some assignments to specific students in a way that I might not have thought to do before. For example, the, ass the assignment that I was talking about earlier where we all filled out the, the same document together, 40 of us, and um, 
one student who's who I know has a day job in a nursing home and she's working more than ever right now. Um, it, she she was late to jump on to that document. And so I just said, oh, well, why don't we just have a conversation about it then? And so we just have been emailing back and forth about that piece. And she knows a lot about it and she didn't have to write a document. So um, I don't know. I, there There is an upside to that for sure. I'm just going to plug one thing quick. There's a lot of special ed questions and I'm going to say when um, Mike Piper sends out the information, contact Sophie because her and her, um, the other special ed teacher on our team that works with the humanities are doing some awesome things with special ed to make sure, better than I can do with the gen ed right now, um, to make sure that they're meeting the accommodations and stuff. So definitely plug her after. I know we're running out of time, but for special ed questions, they're doing great. Thank you, Mary Grace. That's an awesome plug. I just, uh, I don't want to crowd up too much of the time that we have left. Any pushback from kids that, um, you know, if you're not grading this, why should I do it? There's definitely been um, some pushback. And one of the most amazing things I've seen is kids who um, I know are my technology leaders during the school year suddenly don't know how to log into Google Classroom at home and they're playing their parents. Oh, <laughs> and, man. you know, and that really just takes a good conversation to be like, hey, you know, just so you know, mom, dad, whoever, um, this kid knows what they're doing. You're getting played right now. So we just need to all be in the same, you know, kind of, uh, you know, we need to be in the same circle, open the communication, make sure that we're sharing that because um, that's, that's been something I've seen that I did not expect, but nonetheless, here, here we are. <laughs> I think that, yeah, communication aspect of with the students and the families is huge because um, someone had mentioned it before. It's like, you're, you know, the student thinks they did something and then you email the parents and then they're like, why didn't you do that? And then the student's like, oh no, like I thought I did it, but <laughs> in reality, they know they didn't do it to their full potential. But I'm just kind of trying to, you know, send as many emails as possible and almost spamming the kid before I send an email to the parent. But once I get that kid on, like whether it's, you know, I'm doing more Google Meets or I'm going to start calling kids because they're not answering my emails. Um, just kind of trying to plug that. And once you get them on once or twice, or sometimes it takes three times. And believe me, we have our days where we're like, you know, we feel like we're not doing enough for the kids, but then it, we have to look back and think, well, I've already sent how many emails to this kid and their parents. Okay. You know, let's check in on more of a social emotional part. If academically they're not connecting. And once you get them on a couple times, they, they find that it's not too hard, as long as you're not keeping them on for, you know, more than the 30 minutes. Usually I try to do 20 to 30 minutes and then they end up talking to me for an hour about who's dating who now and the <laughs> drama with school and just things that they want to talk to. So once you, it's hard to get them on, I'm not saying it's easy at all. Um, but once you do and you connect with them in that way and have it be more of a conversation as well as academics, then it it's, it's, tends to be easier to get them on in the future. That's what I would say. <laughs> I feel like it's important for us to to note to just as a maybe as a district in this case or as a culture that uh, I don't think that kids saying well if you're not going to grade it I'm not going to do it is a problem with what we're doing now. It's a problem with the culture that we already had established where they thought that it, it was just about the grades or the grades were the grades were the goal or you know there was there was already. That might be revealing to us that they were not invested in ways that we maybe assumed they were, but I think it's a bigger question that we have to come back to after this um, crisis is resolved. Um, I was actually sort of shocked at, at a faculty meeting when so many people said, oh yeah, my students won't do it if it's not graded. And I was like, what? Don't they, 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 they just don't all love learning? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I know I'm not, I'm not quite that naive, but I, I didn't, I did not, I didn't think of that that was going to be such a motivating force for so many of the kids. And I know it's part, partly the top, you know, I'm in English language arts and I'm teaching seniors and electives. So I know that has part of like, that, that's part of the reason I can be in that dream world sometimes. But I do think it's something we have to take a look at. And, um, you know, we, we can't tell students that it's all about the learning, but then have them accessing all the grade programs all the time on their phones between classes. And, and that's, that's sending a very mixed message about what's important and how they should be using their time, I think. And I hope it's something we can remember to come back to later when we have you know, maybe a few more, a few, fewer issues on our plate, I guess. You know, I'm, I'm going to let that be the final word. Uh, 
on, on that issue because it's so well said. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just going to ask Jerome at this point, I'm not sure, I can't see a clock. So um, if, if we want to take any other questions from our chat. There's one uh, minute, Mike. Yeah, Mike, we're at 4.59. Um, I mean, I think at this point we might just have people submit questions via email. Um, if and we can we can do our best to respond to them that to them that way okay then you know i'm just going to say that the slides that i flew through right there are just examples of resources that you'll find on the google site um when i tell you that there are lots of good resources on that google site trust me i, I think you're going to find some things that you'll really appreciate um th these are a couple of questions that i'd like to leave everybody with I've included my email at the bottom, but you'll see that when you go to the Google site, so don't worry about memorizing that. Um, it, it kind of gets to what Alicia started to tilt us toward. What will we educators do with what we're learning now? How might, how should schools look different on the other side of this pandemic? And if these are questions you're interested in pursuing, um, throw me an email because we at CASDA want to keep that conversation alive and moving forward. And we're very, very interested, not only in the work that you professionals are doing right now, but the thinking that's resulting from that work. I want to extend my heartfelt appreciation for our four extraordinary colleagues, um, Alicia and Rob and Sophie and Mary Grace, you're just lovely. I so appreciate the work that you do. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and, and for our participants, um, I just I want you to know that uh, I think about the work you are doing every single day. And I want you to keep positive, keep strong, and, and keep well.